Hi everyone and thanks for watching the video. My name is Glenn Holland and today we'll be taking a look at a new model steam locomotive that I've designed, which is the Oregon Pacific and Eastern 282 90 ton Mikado number 19. Now normally when I do model review videos, I talk about why I'm interested in the locomotive or the model in question and then I go through the history of it and then talk about the details, show some clips of it running and then end the video not long after that. I'll be doing it a little bit differently this time. We'll be taking a look at the extensive history of 19, then we'll go through the model and then show some clips of it running and I'll talk about why I am a fan of 19 at the end. You'll definitely want to stick around for that. So without any further ado, we can dive into the history of the locomotive. 19 was built by the Baldwin Locomotive Works in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania as their number 42,000. Nice even serial number. It's a 282 Mikado type steam locomotive built primarily for use in the logging industry. The technical classification of the locomotive is a 1234 one quarter E30, which is quite a mouthful. The erecting card drawing from Baldwin is number 8440. The engine was originally built as number four for the Caddo and Choctaw Railroad Company, which operated a logging line down in Arkansas. Construction was completed by Baldwin on April 9th, 1915, and it was delivered to the Caddo and Choctaw, quoting the Age of Steam pamphlet, quote, wearing a coat of olive green paint on its wheels, tender, domes, pilot, and cab with a mineral red paint for the cab roof. This handsome 90-ton 282 had a planished iron boiler jacket, black smoke box and firebox, and was decorated with gold lettering and striping. Its cab sides carried the name R. L. Rowan, short for Rufus Lee Rowan, an engineer on the Caddo and Choctaw, end quote. Locomotive number four, R. L. Rowan, stayed on the Caddo and Choctaw in Arkansas, serving the logging industry until 1920. When it was sold to, I apologize if I pronounce this incorrectly, the Compañía de Real del Monte y Pachuca in Mexico, a bit northeast of Mexico City who, on pawn receival of the locomotive, renumbered it to 105. Around the time the engine was sent to Mexico, it was converted to burn oil as opposed to the original coal. It's speculated whether this conversion happened at the Baldwin Locomotive Works or was done on the home railroad or in Mexico due to how some of the firing controls on the locomotive have been set up as well as the arrangement of the firebox itself. The 105 spent four years in Mexico until it was purchased and sent to the McLeod River Railroad in 1924. When McLeod received the locomotive, they renumbered it 19, which is the road number that the engine maintains to this day. Upon its arrival at the McLeod, they brought it into their shop and allowed their crews to get a good look at it before putting the engine into service. As the shop crews looked at it, they found bullet holes in the boiler jacket. At this point, the story formed that the engine served with Pancho Villa during the Mexican Revolution. It was a bit of a tall tale, though, because the revolution was over before the engine arrived in Mexico. However, the story has always stuck with the locomotive, and it earned the nickname Poncho for this reason. The McLeod River kept 19 for almost 30 years, and over that time was responsible for upgrading the locomotive into roughly its current appearance. You'll notice in this April 1936 photograph, the locomotive does look quite different than it does in this November 1952 photograph. Before I pull the photo away, I want to point out the tender that you see mated to 19 in this photo. It's much different than the tender that the engine currently has, meaning that during its time on the McLeod, 19 lost its original tender in a swap. Tender swaps were apparently a very common occurrence on the McLeod. They swapped them as they needed. I have Jeff Moore to thank for this following information. In 1953, which is not too long before the 19 left the McLeod for its next owner, the 19 swapped tenders with the 16. The 16 had apparently already had its tender swapped with the 18. This gets kind of confusing. The 19's tender was mated with the 16 engine on the McLeod in 1953 and stayed with that engine until it was scrapped. The tender from the 16 went to the McLeod 17 and stayed with that engine until it was scrapped. The tender from the 18 went to the 19, and the tender from the 17 went to the McLeod engine 18. The 18 is still in preservation and is in operating condition out in the western United States. It still maintains the tender from the 17 originally. 19, of course, is still in preservation and carries the tender from 18 originally. It should be noted that as far as my research has told me, the tender currently mated with the 18, again, that's the tender originally from McLeod 17, is very similar to 19's original tender. To avoid some level of confusion, the McLeod did keep track of which tenders came from which locomotive. 
To this day, you'll find a welded plate on the frame of the tender behind 19, again, originally from the 18, that is in welded letters says T-18, meaning that that is the tender from the 18 originally. In 1953, McLeod River sold 19 to the Wairika Western to replace some smaller 060 switchers. In 1956, Willis Kyle purchased the Wairika Western Railroad and acquired the 18 from McLeod as well. The 19 and the 18 would operate into 1958 when a diesel replaced both locomotives, but the 18 and 19 were kept in reserve. They went on to pull excursion service and special event trains until 1964 when 18 blew its left cylinder. Willis Kyle went on to acquire 51% of the Oregon Pacific and Eastern out of Cottage Grove, Oregon from Georgia Pacific in 1970, after which he started running Blue Goose excursion trains in June of 1971. 19 was used as motive power on these Blue Goose excursion trains, mostly during the weekend. 19, by the way, was leased from the Wairika to the Oregon Pacific and Eastern. The summer of 1972 saw Hollywood come to the Oregon Pacific and Eastern to film the now rail fan cult classic movie, Emperor of the North, which starred Lee Marvin, Ernest Borgnine, and Keith Carradine. Nineteen was used as motive power for the train in the film. It stars in the movie nearly entirely start to finish, and the name Nineteen was used for the name of the train itself. Nineteen was thoroughly overhauled for its appearance in the movie as specified in the contract between the Oregon Pacific and Eastern and the production company. It carried the unique State of Oregon Herald only during the filming of the movie and for a few short years after production wrapped. The latest I've seen Nineteen with this Herald on it is 1974. 19 continued working on the Oregon Pacific and Eastern into the 1980s, pulling Blue Goose excursion trains with a large variety of equipment, even including a Zephyr Dome observation car. In 1986, 19 was repainted all black for its appearance in another movie, which was the classic coming-of-age film Stand By Me, based on the Stephen King novel. Parts of Stand By Me were filmed along the Oregon Pacific and Eastern right-of-way in Oregon, and 19 does make an appearance in the movie, though not during the famous bridge scene where the kids are running across the trestle getting out of the way of the train. McLeod 25 was the engine used in that scene. 19 appears earlier in the film in which Corey Feldman is standing in between the rails waiting to play chicken with the oncoming locomotive and jump out of the way at the last second. 19 was the locomotive used during that scene. Willis Kyle unfortunately passed away not long after this, and lumber traffic on the Oregon Pacific and Eastern declined. Willis Kyle's portion of the Oregon Pacific and Eastern was sold to Bohemia Lumber, and 19 went back to Wairika in 1987. It was again overhauled at Wairika, and then went on to pull Blue Goose excursion trains on that railroad starting in 1989, and hauled the occasional freight train. 19 is claimed to be the only lo steam locomotive in revenue freight service at this time. It was often used to assist failed diesels. There's a famous story in which the 19 once brought 13 loaded wood chip cars plus a failed diesel up as much of a 2% grade into Montague where the Wairika interchange with Southern Pacific. The train arrived at 2 o'clock in the morning and many people at home asleep near the tracks called to complain about the loud bark from 19's exhaust. The engine then became the subject of a legal battle in 2006 due to some work that was never paid for that had been performed on the engine. Around this time, 19 received a Nathan Six Chime whistle in place of its original. A lien was placed on the engine due to non-payment for the work performed and went through six years of court battles until it was eventually auctioned off in a sheriff's sale on October 6, 2016. There was spirited bidding between the Valley Railroad in Connecticut and Jerry Jacobson with his Age of Steam Roundhouse. Jerry eventually won the auction with a $400,000 bid. The 19 was loaded onto a Casgro Rail Corporation heavy-duty flat car and began its journey across the country on April 3, 2017. Two months later, on June 6, the locomotive and its tender arrived at the Age of Steam Roundhouse in Sugar Creek, Ohio. The locomotive is currently in the back shop at the Age of Steam Roundhouse Museum undergoing its 15-year inspection. And that brings us to the present day. Clearly, there is a lot of history in this locomotive. There are truly a lot of unique details and really interesting pieces of history that really make this locomotive stand out from the rest. 
But now with the history out of the way, we can take a more in-depth look at the model itself. My model of 19 represents the locomotive as it appeared in Emperor of the North. So this was about summer of 1972 until filming wrapped on October 7th that year. I've made a few different attempts to design a model of 19, the first of which, as far as I can remember, was in 2010, not too long after I saw Emperor of the North for the first time in January of that year. This version came together digitally in late 2019, and I started ordering parts for the model in January 2020. I have been working on it pretty much off and on since then. It does feature a lot of new design techniques that I tried. A lot of them are not necessarily new anymore because I've been working on this locomotive for so long, but it is finally all together. The locomotive model is complete and I'm very happy to have it done and ready to publish. Now we can take a closer look at the locomotive and check out some of the details. Here's a look at the front face of the locomotive. We'll start down here with the pilot, which I've got nicely modeled here. I don't have any functional front coupler on the locomotive. The front coupler was never used in Emperor of the North, so I felt it was okay to omit that detail on the model. It did allow me to build the pilot a little bit more accurately to the locomotive. Everything below the pilot beam itself is actually seven studs wide. The cow catcher is really interesting and features some interesting techniques. I feel that the sacrifice of a working front coupler was worth it, but I did include the some sort Sort of resemblance of a coupler on the front. Moving a little bit farther up, we've got the iconic curved grab irons and the crossbar that goes across the face of the smoke box just below the headlight. The number board underneath the headlight, which does resemble the original. This is my cast aluminum copy of the original. And of course, the headlight just above that. And at the top of the smoke box is the dynamo generator. Looking now at the fireman side of the locomotive, which was the side of the engine most prominently seen in Emperor of the North, we've got the builder's plate decal installed there on the side of the smoke box. As always, the artwork on this locomotive was faithfully and meticulously created by Kale Leapart and features a mix of decals and printed parts. The printed parts are from Richard Gladder at Brick Print Studios and the decals are from OK Brickworks. Thank you to all of those guys for their help in this project. Beneath the running board here, we've got the cylinders modeled. The valve and the cylinder stems move in and out of the pistons. This is actually the first time I've ever used this arrangement of rods and cylinders and crossheads and everything on a model. Everything I built after this, including my model of Moorhead and North Fork 12 and Nickel Plate 763, for example, does derive its geometry and design from this. I've worked on 19 for several years, as I mentioned. This is the first iteration of this kind of arrangement of rods and valve gear. I did kind of eventually perfect it. A lot of these parts went through several iterations of design, but they do work very well, and I'm very happy with them. You'll notice the crosshead, union link, and combination lever are all differently colored than the rest of the connecting rods. In Emperor of the North, they are kind of a very brown, rusty, oily uh, look. So I decided to paint these pieces in a flat brown color to model that as appeared in the movie. All wheels on the locomotive, that includes the pilot, driving wheels, and trailing wheels, are some of my first attempts to model and design steam locomotive wheels. Uh, they are not necessarily as perfect as can be it anymore, considering all of the new things that I know now, having modeled wheels for other locomotive projects since starting these, but they do work very well. I'm still very happy with them and have no reason to replace them, so I'll leave them on the model. One of the more interesting features about 19 is that it features an inside frame trailing axle. The axle does pivot on the real locomotive. It is set up to articulate as such, but it was kind of an interesting challenge. It does feature an inside frame and the linkages on the trailing truck are a little bit unique compared to more typical Mikado locomotives. So that was kind of a challenge, but I feel I've done a pretty good job making the frame look as if it's completely connected like it is on the real locomotive and not breaking up the appearance too much. I think it's a really interesting feature. I've got the firebox modeled here. I did use the same paint as the rods on these side sheets of the firebox, just to give it a little bit more of a metallic look. We've got the overflow hose from the injector on this side. It's kind of hard to see, but this hose is actually cut at an angle down here. That is another very minute detail featured and seen in the movie and maintains on the locomotive today. So I felt it necessary to model that. And the blowdown valve and nozzle and reach rod are modeled here on the side of the firebox as well. Moving up the side of the locomotive, we've got several more pipes and the valve gear yoke modeled here with several linkages represented there and the cross compound air compressor on the fireman side of the locomotive mounted under the very uniquely shaped walkway. 
Towards the top of the locomotive, of course, we've got the smokes tech here. And this little feature here is actually a catch for the spark arrester that was installed on the McLeod. 19 no longer has the spark arrester, but during the Emperor of the North, you can see this catch, which would hold the spark arrester as it hinged down from the top of the smokestack. The spark arrester was not featured in the movie, but was removed. This catch, however, stayed in the film, so I felt it appropriate to model that as well. Moving farther back, we've got the first sand dome. I used some string to model the sanding lines, which is one of the first times that I've done that. I think it works well on this model. We've got the bell, which I used a dull a uh, metallic paint pen to represent the brass color on that, the steam dome and the whistle, and the rear sand dome as well, and the safety pop-up valves just in front of the cab. Looking now towards the fireman side of the cab, I've got this window here nicely modeled. This was a really interesting decal challenge to get right. I'm really happy with the way it turned out. It's actually a black decal with a printed window frame pattern around it put over some clear Lego bricks. I'm very happy with the way it turned out. I will probably use that feature again in the future. I do have crew figures for the locomotive. They're not in there now, but I'll show them off in a little bit, but they can sit inside of the cab. I did use a much different construction technique for the walls of the cab, which allow the crew to sit much closer to the sides of the wall than normal. And it allows for a third minifigure to be standing in the middle of the cab like it does in the movie. Back here, I've got the canvas partition rolled up nicely. That was a really interesting feature, kind of prominent featured in a few shots of the cab in Emperor of the North, so I felt it appropriate to model there. And as always, the cab roof vent modeled in the open position here. Before we move on, here's a better look at the front of the cab. You can see the front cab doors are printed there. That was a really interesting job and one of the more difficult prints that I've ever had done on a model. So again, thank you to Richard for his help there. And you'll notice the front cab windows just below the roof are lined in red. That was also done by Richard. Gives for a very good look. 19 does feature red trim in a few places in Emperor of the North. It's not prominently featured, but I felt it was good enough to model on the front cab windows. Looking now at the tender, this, as you can see, this is a very small tender. It was a little bit of a challenge to get everything in the tender and model the details properly, but I think I've done a pretty good job. We'll start with the trucks. You'll notice the journal box lids on these are all printed. 19 has had as many as four unique designs of journal box lids in its life. It was really interesting to find those details out, and they are all printed, and as far as I can tell, match the movie exactly. I have to thank Kale again for his uh, work doing these journal box lids. It did get very finicky and meticulous in particular, um, but I think the overall effect is worth it. It's a really neat feature, and 19 keeps a lot of these same journal box patterns today. It still maintains as many as four unique designs. And speaking of artwork, we've got the iconic State of Oregon logo for the Oregon Pacific and Eastern here on the center of the tender. Now I have to kind of go off script and just kind of speak my mind about this because this is one of the most particular pieces of artwork I have ever had done for a model ever. Kale and I literally spent hours upon weeks upon months over the course of at least a couple years doing different versions and different iterations of this logo. It's so particular. It's very difficult to find good photos of it. I'm very grateful to have acquired several better photos of the logo itself, but still incredibly particular. It, the details on it are very, very fine, but all of that is to say this is one of the most accurate, if not the single most accurate, State of Oregon Herald for the OP&E that I have ever seen. It's far more accurate than uh, a lot of the other fan creations that I've ever seen. That's not said to disparage their work, but I wanted the extra level of accuracy in my model, so Kale and I did spend several, several, several months and weeks and hours going through the details on this. We literally picked it apart piece by piece and got it more accurate than I've ever seen before. It is my favorite piece of artwork on any model that I've ever had. I love it to death and I'm very, very happy with the way that it turned out. Kale, I know you're watching this. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. I love the way that this turned out. As I said earlier, this logo for the Oregon Pacific and Eastern was only ever painted on 19 for the filming of Emperor of the North. It did maintain this logo at least until part of 1974, but then it was replaced with the genuine Oregon Pacific and Eastern Blue Goose logo. There are a few more references to Emperor of the North model than the tender, probably the most iconic of which, if you've seen the movie you know what I'm talking about, is the pin in which Shaq, the conductor played by Ernest Borgnine, 
uses this pin to keep hobos from riding underneath the cars. You definitely have to see the movie to know what I'm talking about. It is a very interesting scene. Now, as I said earlier, 19 was converted to burn oil as opposed to coal. And around the time that it was sent to Mexico, it has been an oil burning locomotive ever since. And here I am modeling a load of coal in the tender. Why in the world would I do that? Well, thanks to some very interesting research that I found through researching Emperor of the North and 19 in general, I found that for filming of Emperor of the North, coal was required for the script. They replaced the large oil bunker that is currently sitting on top of 19 with a much smaller one and spread a load of coal around the top of it. The 19 burned oil during the film, but they did shovel coal into the firebox. They shoveled probably about 12 chunks of coal in there in total, but necessary thing to do. The script requires coal. The engine's an oil burner. Little movie magic. They made it work very nicely. A lot of people get very confused about this detail, but this is genuine information found during my research. I'm very happy to know this. It was really interesting to find that out. As I said, the 19 received the tender from the McLeod 18 in 1953, and it maintains that tender to this day. I did also mention that the tender has a T-18 plate welded in on the frame of the tender. Actually, there's one on each side of the frame, and I've modeled that here with a tiny piece of printed artwork, thanks to Richard Gladder again, that does actually represent the T-18 plate. It's the same on both sides. Actually, the printing itself is a print of the photo that I took of the frame of 19. So it's as genuine as it can get. Looking now at the rear of the tender from the engineer's side of the locomotive, we've got the ladder here on the left side of the tender tank with the very interesting looking curved grab irons. I used a couple of the Lego whip pieces for that. I had to cut them down to make them fit, but I really like the result that I got from it. I'm very happy with that. Of course, typical details include the rear headlight and number painted on the rear of the tender wall. There is unfortunately no space for a minifigure to ride that part of the tender. Again, if you've seen the movie, you'll know what I'm talking about. But moving farther down, we've got a KD knuckle coupler here. I had to trim off the piece on the bottom, which allows the coupler to open if you have the magnetic decoupler. Because of this wooden uh, step rail or foot footboard here that goes across the length of the tender. I had to model that. I couldn't leave that out, so I had to modify the coupler to suit, but it does work quite well. Looking now at the engineer's side of the locomotive, for whatever reason, they didn't feature this side too heavily in Emperor of the North. Uh, they must have had some reason for filming most of the movie from the fireman's side, but I did model the engineer's side as accurately as I could. I do have some very good references, which I'm very thankful to have. A lot of the detail is similar from one side of the locomotive to the other. Of course, we've got the wheels and connecting rods here. Valve gear yoke, mechanical lubricator, typical details for locomotives that I model, just like the power reverse as well. Several more pipes towards the rear of the locomotive. And there is kind of hard to see, but there's a small one by one cheese slope mounted here on the side of the boiler, which represents what was, as far as I can tell, a camera mount that was put onto the side of the boiler and left there for part of filming. It is actually seen in a couple shots during the movie. And I believe I can pick out a couple of different shots uh, elsewhere in the movie where they had a camera on this mount. So I thought it was an interesting detail to leave in my model. And of course, I can fit an engineer crew figure in this side of the cab as well. Here's a look into the cab itself. And right off the bat, you'll notice the canvas partition, which I've modeled above the opening of the cab. I did use a canvas-like material wrapped around some one-by-one -one round bricks, which I think gives a very nice look. Looking farther into the cab, I've got some printed gauge tiles across several different parts of the cab which I'm very thankful to have in there, thanks to Kale and uh, for allowing me to use some of those. I've also got a genuine information plate that is mounted to the back head on 19 itself. That's a real photo of that plate in the same way that the T-18 plate is a printing of the real plate itself. And on the engineer's side, I've got several more controls, including the throttle and the sanding lever. A reference to the iconic line, Give Her Sand, shouted by Ernest Borgnine during one of the more interesting parts of the film. You'll have to watch it to know what I'm talking about. And speaking of sand, once again, I do have real locomotive sand poured into both of the sand domes on this model. And of course, I couldn't just use any old locomotive sand. I had to use real sand. And the sand that I'm using is real genuine sand taken from the sand domes on the real 19 itself. These vials are actually sold by the Aegis Steam Roundhouse Museum gift shop. I have two of them. This is the one that I opened. You'll notice that it's not quite full. The remainder that used to be in here is currently inside of both of these sand domes. 
What could be more appropriate than that? Under the hood, I'm using a single Power Functions L motor mounted in the boiler and firebox to drive the driving wheels at a one to one gear ratio. Gives me a good balance between speed and power, especially with these much smaller diameter driving wheels. The motor is controlled by a Lego infrared receiver, which I've got tucked away in the tender. There's not a whole lot of room in there, but it's in there. I believe I'm using one of the V2 power functions receivers as opposed to the original one. The V2 is known to have better hardware installed in it, which makes the motor operate a little bit more happily. They're a little bit more rare and a little bit more expensive, but I had one on hand and felt 19 was an appropriate engine to put it in. The motor and receiver are powered by a single 7.4 volt, 700 milliamp battery hidden away in the tender. As I said, I didn't have a whole lot of space in there, so I had to go for the smaller 700 milliamp battery compared to the more commonly used 2200 milliamp battery that I use in a lot of larger locomotives. It's a smaller battery, but the upper engine still operates very nicely. I can replace the battery very easily, so I can have several batteries charging, operate the locomotive and swap them out without too much issue. Now, I did say I've got a locomotive crew built up for this engine, but I've got a little bit more than that, actually. I've basically represented the six main characters of Emperor of the North in Lego minifigure form, and we can go through them. We'll start with pretty much the main character, the main protagonist, A number one. A number one in Emperor of the North is played by Lee Marvin, who is basically the best hobo. He plays a very wise and knowledgeable and class act hobo and tries to ride Shaq's train from Cottage Grove to Portland. And that basically sets up the entire premise of the movie. I've modeled a number one here in the basically the first two, three quarters of the movie probably before he kind of goes through a wardrobe change before the climax of the movie. I've used pretty much all regular Lego parts, minifigure parts for this figure. Um, the base, of course, is printed thanks to Richard Gladder and Kale's artwork, but I'm very happy with this. I think it's a good representation of Lee Marvin as a number one in Emperor of the North. Next up, we've got the main antagonist, which is Shaq. Shaq is played by Ernest Borgnine in the film, who is the ruthless conductor of the 19, and Shaq would do anything in his power to stop a hobo from riding his train. And you'll see in the movie that he does use a lot of different tactics to keep people from riding his train for free. You'll see I've modeled him holding the iconic length of chain, which he uses towards the climax of the film. I think it's a pretty good representation of Ernest Borgnine. Once again, I used 100% Lego minifigure parts to model Shaq. Um, apart from the cap, the cap is actually a piece that I acquired from Brickmania. I'm very thankful to them. It was the cap included in the New York Central Caboose. They had a few extras of them, which I purchased from them. I'm very thankful to have those. I've got a few more in my collection, so I thought it was appropriate to use for Shaq uh, in this minifigure. Again, the printed minifigure plate is from Richard Glider. Next up, we've kind of got the tertiary main character, which is Cigarette. Cigarette is basically a young kid. He's played by Keith Carradine in the movie and kind of plays a very young and dumb, uh, up and coming, maybe not up and coming, but plays a young hobo, kind of a tramp kid that's roamed around a little bit and starts to stick with a number one and tries to learn the rules of the road. It's a very uh, interesting relationship that they form, kind of uh, goes right up to the climax and uh, right up to the resolution of the movie. Uh, doesn't really have a great ending, I will say. The entirety of Emperor of the North really doesn't have a great ending, uh, but it's a very realistic thing, in my opinion. I'll talk more about that in a little bit, but you'll notice that I've got a jacket around him. He does use a sort of a brown jacket for most of the movie, again, until that costume change most of the way through, and uh, you can see I've got him wearing suspenders. You'll have to watch the movie to understand why suspenders are an important plot device. Next up, we've got the Brakeman of the 19, which is the character named Cracker. Cracker is played by Charles Tyner and kind of is a very wishy-washy, kind of just tag-along character compared to Shaq for certain. He kind of lives in Shaq's shadow and um, basically is kind of just tagging along and just tries to keep Shaq happy for the, for the film. Very interesting character, kind of um, very, very well played in my opinion by Charles Tyner. Um, I, you'll see I've noted I've got another jacket on him. He does have kind of this tan colored jacket. I've done my best to model that with uh, the same fabric material that I've got for the canvas partition on the locomotive. And I've got him holding his Brakeman club. I think it's a pretty good representation. But again, the rest of the minifigure is regular Lego parts. Next in line, we have the engineer of the 19, which is the character Hogger. 
Hogger is played by Malcolm Atterbury. Basically a very minor, relatively speaking anyways, it's a minor role compared to the other ones. Doesn't have a whole lot of screen time, but he's also kind of one of those guys that just kind of has to go along with Shaq just because Shaq is the conductor of the, of the train, you know, but he does play his part very well. I think they did actually do a very good job casting this movie. So I've got uh, this figure, again, using 100% genuine Lego parts, representing Malcolm Atterbury as Hogger. And last but not least, we have the Fireman of 19, which is Coley. Coley is played by Harry Caesar in the movie. Very well played again, similar to Malcolm Atterbury's uh, Hogger. Very uh, minor role compared to the other uh, characters. Featured a few times in the movie, doesn't really move the plot forward in a lot of ways, but does a very good job in his supporting role, in my opinion. Again, I think that they did a very good job casting this movie. So I've got this 100% genuine Lego part minifigure representing Harry Caesar as Coley. They did use a caboose behind 19 to film Emperor of the North, so of course I had to model that car as well. This is Oregon Pacific and Eastern Caboose number three, which is a real caboose from the Oregon Pacific and Eastern itself. Before being featured in the movie, it was painted in a two-tone blue scheme, kind of dark blue below the windows and light blue above, and it was repainted into this orange and sand blue and dark gray and white, bunch of colors, uh, for the movie. Uh, specifically. A very striking scheme. I was actually not aware of the sand blue color, which you can see I've got represented here along the uh, roof line here in the cupola. I was not aware of that color until pretty recently, relatively speaking, in my research, and I was able to find a lot of better photos of this caboose uh, as it appeared in the movie. So I was able to kind of go th back through my design and correct a lot of things, and I'm really happy with the way it turned out. Now I should say the caboose is not completely 100% done. There are just a few final decals that I'm waiting on to call the model finished, but those are very minor, so I felt it appropriate enough and complete enough to include in this video behind 19. Of course, I modeled the caboose with an accurately represented interior uh, as seen in Emperor of the North. It was interesting to uh, go through the research and find out the information about this car. The real one is actually a Southern Pacific design, so that was uh, very helpful in finding out what the interior of this car looked like. Thanks to that and a few uh, interesting shots in Emperor of the North, the interior is very accurately modeled right down to a Coca-Cola advertisement that's only just seen for a few seconds in the movie, but it sits basically right next to the window on the opposite side of the car. That was a really interesting detail. I was actually able to find that same Coca-Cola advertisement online and have Kale scale it down for me and have it printed as a decal, and I've got it sitting inside of the car. Really interesting feature and kind of something that hardly anybody would know about unless you really watch the movie and know what to look for, but I'm happy to include it as well. Here's a slightly closer look at this end of the car. Right off the bat, you'll notice the white ladder here mounted to the end of the car. Very happy with the way that turned out. I used some uh, wire here in the uh, inside of the flex tube to get it to maintain the shape. I really like the look of it. Uh, the rungs here down the ladder are actually custom parts that I designed uh, and myself and had printed by Rob Hendricks. Thank you to Rob for his help there. Uh, it's basically a slightly lengthened version of the Brick Arms U-Clip piece. Very happy with the way it turns out. I like the geometry of it and it works quite well, I think. And uh, I guess the last thing I can point out on this end is the brake wheel. I'm quite happy with the way that that turned out as well. You might be able to notice on the cupola windows, I've got some lines that kind of run across the window insert pieces there. That represents some metal bars that went over the windows on the cupola and actually on the end of the car as well, but not the doors. That's more correct details according to Emperor of the North. You might also be able to see that this particular window only has the bottom two bars present as opposed to three, which the rest of the windows have. You can't see all of them, but this window only having two bars again is another accurate detail to the movie. Now the caboose is just the start of the rest of my modeling plans. I do would like to model the rest of the freight train scene in Emperor of the North behind 19. The caboose is just the start of that, but I felt that the having the 19 done and then having the caboose done was the most appropriate way to start. I do have a lot of designs in progress and some physical models in progress as well of the rest of the freight cars. I'd love to show those off hopefully very soon in the future as I complete them. But now that we've seen the 19 and the caboose in detail, we can get them both down onto the floor and see how they run. All right, I've got 19 down here on some track on the floor. I've got a train behind it and the caboose on the end. Let's take it out and see how it runs.
now for something a little bit different. I usually don't get in front of the camera when I talk about um, models or anything like that. So this is a little bit different, but, and the rest of the video is basically just going to be me talking. So if all you wanted to see was the model of 19, you can feel free to click off now. But I'd like to do this last part, hopefully in one take. So hopefully I won't ramble too much, but what I would like to do for the last part of this video is tell a story. And this story basically starts in 2009, probably when I first became familiar with Emperor of the North, whenever that was exactly. But I remember watching people recreate scenes from Emperor of the North and watching videos on YouTube, um, particularly the almost a head on collision scene. Uh, if you've seen the movie, you know what exactly what I'm talking about. It's about halfway through. And people had recreated that in train simulators on, on their computer and uploaded it to YouTube. And I remember being really interested in what I was looking at because, and I remember thinking, if a movie has got a scene like this in it, then it's got to be pretty interesting. So at that point, I really decided that I wanted to watch Emperor of the North. So fast forward a little bit, January 2010, I uh, acquired a DVD of the movie. And January 22nd, 2010, I saw Emperor of the North for the first time. I watched it at home with my parents. Uh, none of us had ever seen it before. Uh, they didn't know what to expect, neither did I. Um, it's quite a rough and tumble movie, as a lot of movies from that time period tend to be, especially with actors like Lee Marvin and Ernest Borgnine. Um, but I remember being really struck by the movie. It was really interesting. Of course, it had trains in it, so I was interested in it for that reason. But I remember just really enjoying what I was watching. It, you know, It's a very unique and particular movie, but I, it has always stuck with me and continues to do so to this day. I'll get more on that in a little bit, but watching Emperor of the North in January 2010 was also the first time that I saw 19. Um, I remember when 19 came across the screen for the first time in kind of a full profile view of the fireman side of the engine, just like this. Um, right at the beginning of the movie, there's the movie starts with some scenes uh, of 19 running with a freight train behind it through Oregon countryside, which is really nice. And I remember looking at the engine for the first time and instantly I was captivated by it because it was not like a locomotive that I had seen before. It was very unique in particular and um, very, very uh, a nice looking engine in my opinion. And I remember trying to really pick apart what I was looking at as the locomotive was just on the screen for, you know, a little bit and then it would cut to the next shot or whatever. And, but I was really struck by the locomotive and really, really fascinated with it. So we finished the movie and, you know, I went on just becoming more and more interested in the movie. Starting at that point, I, like I said, I started a few attempts to model the 19 in Lego or create a design from it. I never actually built anything physical. It was all digital at that point, but fast forwarding a little bit more, the interest in the movie and Emperor of the, uh, Emperor of the North in 19 never really died out. And it stuck with me well into college. Um, when I had followed the story of 19 at that point and, you know, became really familiar with the engine. I'd researched the engine for, you know, off and on for quite a while at that point and was very familiar with the engine and a lot of the story behind it. Um, not as well familiar as I am now, but, you know, I was still very familiar with it and it was growing on me substantially. And of course, this was about the time that uh, the engine was purchased by Gary Jacobson and, and the Steam Roundhouse. And um, October 2016, it uh, was purchased and then moved in April of the next month and went to Age of Steam Roundhouse, which was, as it turns out, was not too far away from where I was at the time. So Kale and I decided to pay a visit and we did. Um, I uploaded video of that onto YouTube, actually. Uh, the first time I went to Age of Steam was t September 2017. Um, actually it was just a few weeks after, uh, Jerry Jacobson had passed, uh, unfortunately, so I never got the chance to meet him, but I've obviously been able to, uh, appreciate his, his, uh, his legacy. Uh, Kale and I went out there on, I believe, September 23rd, pretty sure it was the 23rd, been a few years already. We went out there and had a nice box lunch. This was, uh, before Age of Steam was doing any regular guided tours at the time, and this was all coordinated by the Fort Wayne Railroad Historical Societies, um, which was a very nice thing. We got a box lunch and ate on a passenger car, which was kind of neat. And then 
we went on the tour and I remember thinking and kind of in my head beforehand that expecting to see 19 basically how it looked when they unloaded it off the flat car after bringing it to Ohio um kind of just you know rusty and you know disassembled slightly and everything like that and that's what I was expecting to see but we got into the museum got into the roundhouse and um just off the left where you enter the roundhouse for a tour through stall six off to the left I believe it was in stall eight was 19 but it looked almost exactly like this they had done a complete cosmetic restoration to the engine at that point or before that point the engine looked very close to how it appeared in Emperor of the North and I was instantly blown away and at that moment I truthfully I fell in love with the locomotive all over again um Having gone through the process of researching the engine and researching its history and the movies it was involved in and the railroads that it ran on, getting to that point where I was able to finally see the locomotive with my own eyes for the first time and experience the locomotive being actually physically in front of me was an amazing experience. It was really, really gratifying to be able to do that finally. Um, Kale and I kind of made the joke to ourselves that... Um, I could have left the tour after having seen 19 and I probably would have been perfectly happy. I'm glad that I went on the rest of the tour, but um, the highlight of that weekend far and away was seeing 19 for the first time. And being at Age of Steam, it just kind of worked out that it's still not terribly far away and I was able to start going to Age of Steam more over the couple years after September 2017. and participate in uh, several tours that they put on and several events that they started doing uh, when they in 2019 they started doing regular public tour programs and a few different things in addition to that I was on their first uh, extended three hour tour and I was on their first um, blue flag tour event which is an all day tour uh, experience which was both of those are uh, an absolute load of fun um, and it got to the point where I uh, basically became known to some of the people at Age of Steam by name and face, which was uh, kind of a fun, ex fun thing to have happen. Um, but basically all of that kind of culminates in early 2020, I went out to one of the wi winter speaker presentations that they did, which was not like a tour, but it was just a small presentation that they had on some related topic inside of the visitor center um, there at the museum property. But after the presentation had ended, I was standing around and talking to uh, some of the employees at Age of Steam, and it basically ended in me asking if I could submit a volunteer application. And they said, we would love to have you, and I submitted the application. And then COVID happened, um, which put a, uh, put a hold on things for a while, uh, as expected. But June of 2020, they started opening up again, and I went out there to start helping in whatever way that I could. I became involved with the tour program there and um, helped push tours and help, you know, kind of, basically I was an extra set of hands, um, which went quite well. And I was able to, you know, finish out that tour season in 2020, you know, as a volunteer at the Age of Steam Roundhouse Museum and has been a fantastic, gratifying experience. Um, I came back in the 2021 season, basically getting out there and every, every weekend that I could which is most mostly just Saturdays, but uh, 2021, when the season started, I started guiding my own tours and giving my own tour program to visitors, which has also been an extremely gratifying experience, um, just even as a volunteer. And I've continued to help out with the different events that they put on in 2021 and everything and finished out that season really strongly. And then earlier this year in 2022, I hired on part-time um, and, that brings us to now. I'm part-time employed at the Age of Steam Roundhouse Museum, um, mostly as a tour guide. I guide tours, I guide the extended tours and have a hand in um, helping out with a lot of the special events that they do, like the uh, military uh, Steam to Victory event, uh, the Santa Comes to the Roundhouse events, um, and a number of other ones too. Um, it's been an incredible, just absolutely amazing experience that I could not be any more grateful to be a part of. It's, it's a fascinating and just inspiring place to be and I'm so incredibly thankful that I can be a part of it um, and really be a part of 
the caretaking group of 19 now. I'm not physically doing the work myself, but I'm able to be there and, you know, walk people through the museum and talk to them about 19 and um, get them excited, hopefully, about why they should be interested in trains and railroading and heritage and history and what they're looking at there in the museum. It's a really incredible experience and incredible thing to be able to do and have one, the opportunity to do, but then two, have the capability to do it. It's, I'm truly, truly grateful to be able to say that that is something that I do on a regular basis. It's, it's been absolutely amazing. And I was reflecting the other day, well, before I get into that, um, Age of Steam really has been a truly wonderful place to be. And I mean, through Age of Steam, there's been a number of other new opportunities that I have, um, that have presented themselves to me and things that I never would have expected. Um, 13 years ago, almost, when I was watching Emperor of the North for the first time, I've, you know, participated in photography events, but not as a photographer, but rather as an actor in front of the camera. Um, I've done that twice now this year which has been another incredible experience that I never would have imagined that I would be doing. Um, that has also led to kind of a new sub hobby of, you know, vintage work wear and, you know, vintage like clothes and basically picking apart how would a railroad worker in the 1940s live and go to work and what kinds of things would they have and things like that. Like behind the camera, I've got an antique lunchbox and thermos. That's part of it. Um, I've got an outfit or two worth of work clothes in my closet, not to mention a genuine, as genuine as can be, Pennsylvania Road conductor uniform, which has been an absolute, it, I never would have expected that these opportunities would present themselves to me. And it's been an amazing experience to just have all of those things happen. And I was reflecting the other day in finishing this model and kind of, you know, looking at it. And now that the model is complete, I was kind of got to thinking about it and basically arrived at the conclusion that if I wasn't such a fan of 19, I probably wouldn't be doing all the things that I'm doing right now with Age of Steam and everything else that that has uh, opened. Um, 19 has such a rich, incredible history. As like I talked about in earlier in the earlier part of this video, there's so much history and so much many details and you know little tidbits of information and really just truly interesting stuff behind this locomotive. It's just a 90 ton piece of machinery at its core, but there's so much involved with this locomotive. It's such got such an amazing story, and now I'm part of that story. I'm part of the group, like I said, part of the group that's care taking care of the locomotive and keeping it around for, you know, new generations of people to enjoy and experience and, and, and come to know. And it's been incredible, but 19 is also a part of my own story at this point. Like I said, if I wasn't as such a fan of 19 as I am, if I didn't have such a genuine love for this locomotive, all of those other opportunities probably never would have presented themselves in such a way. I owe a lot to this locomotive, or the real one, and my model of it may never be as technically impressive as a lot of the other things that I build. I've been working on this for some time and I've learned a lot uh, between the start and finish points of this model. I would say this is probably just version one. I would love to build a new version of this engine someday with you know, even better techniques and experiences. But no matter how many models of 19 I build, no matter how many other models of locomotives and cars that I might build, no matter how much I enjoy all of those other things, all of those other things will never have what 19 has for me. There's so much involved in this engine and there's so, I'm, I'm a part of the story of this engine and this engine is part of my own story. I owe a lot to the locomotive, like I said. I get asked a lot in um, live streams or social media or whatever, um, what is your favorite steam locomotive? And I've never really given a complete answer. I've either dodged the question or just not answered or given a non-answer or anything like that. But I'm finally able to say now that Oregon Pacific and Eastern 19 is my favorite steam locomotive for all of those reasons that I've described. and. Hopefully I've done a good job of describing them, but there's so much involved in this engine. 
it's just mind blowing. And I'm, it, I'm so incredibly excited to be able to finally talk about it now that my model of it is complete and be able to talk about my interest in Emperor of the North and the Oregon Pacific and Eastern and all of the tangential topics that have stemmed from this locomotive that I'm interested in now. I'm so excited to finally be at this point where I can call this model complete and publish it and finally be able to talk about these things with everybody because I enjoy it so much. I'm able to talk about the things that I genuinely enjoy and it's kind of a self-imposed limitation, but now you all have the context of why I was waiting to this point. It's, it's a very special moment for me to have this locomotive done and to finally get to this point of opening up this new line of conversation and line of research and, and everything. I've got a lot of stuff that I'm excited about related to 19. There's a lot of plans and ideas that I have in mind for um, my research of, of the locomotive and Emperor of the North and the railroad and, and everything like that. I've got a lot of ideas that are not related to that. I've got a lot of things that I, to look forward to with Age of Steam and, and beyond. And again, all of that comes back to my appreciation for this locomotive. It's far and above my favorite locomotive. I don't think it will ever become, be not my favorite locomotive anymore. Um, it's that special. And now you know why. I've talked a lot. Hopefully it all made sense. Um, I would like to thank everybody for watching and all the support before I ramble too much longer. It truly does mean a lot to me to uh, interact with people who appreciate my work. I'm always sincerely humbled and grateful for all of the comments and, and uh, compliments that I get when I publish uh, new pieces and everything like that. It does sincerely mean a lot to me, so I'd like to extend my sincerest thanks to everybody for that. But um, there's more to look forward to soon. More I'm excited to share um, as, as best I can and as, uh, as soon as I can. Um, I've, I've got a lot that I want to do and there's a lot that, um, there's a lot of opportunities that I'm looking forward to. I'm excited for all of that and I can't wait to share it with everyone. But for now though, I'll leave it there. Thank you once again for the support. Thank you for an amazing year. More to come soon and I'll talk to you all later.